uh, when she came to visit the Relativity Group at Princeton during the early 1970s. I was an undergraduate there at the time, working with John Wheeler and Jimmy York on the conformal method. I was eager to meet Yvonne, um, since she was one of the leading developers of the conformal method. I was also a little afraid to meet her, since I knew she was friends with Cecile DeWitt, who had caught me trying to crash the uh, Ecole d'Ete at uh, Les Zouches on Black Holes the previous summer. Well, in any case, Yvonne gave a wonderful talk at Princeton, and after it, I came to introduce myself and tell her about my work on adapting the conformal method to the Einstein-Maxwell system, the Einstein-Dirac, Brin's Dickey theories, and others. She was marvelously receptive, although I think she already knew pretty much everything I was talking about. She was also uh, quite receptive when I met her again seven years later at a conference, and uh, she even pretended to remember me. Um, and that was when we began our first collaboration when we started working on uh, the well posedness of classical supergravity. Well, I'm not going to bore you by telling you about all the other times we met and the, uh, the many collaborations we worked on together later. I think it, I counted about nine papers we wrote together. But um, all of these meetings and these collaborations were, were really quite wonderful for me, and I'm exceptionally proud to uh, think of myself as a longtime collaborator and, um, and good friend of Yvonne. So thank you for all those years. Yeah. Well, she's worked on many, many things, but I like to think that the conformal method is one of her favorites, and so that's what I chose to talk about. Um, I'll, tell, I'll remind those, uh, I presume most of you have heard of the conformal method, I'll quickly remind you about it, and I'll talk about uh, its major successes, which I think one can, I mean, the, the work on, the, on constant mean curvature for a, a number of cases is quite old, and it, there it's its most successful. There's been more recent work some places where there are challenges as well. Uh, near CMC, uh, that's also somewhat old, and that's another one of our collaborations, but uh, I think even recently there's been some nice work to, in a sense, finish the job there. But it's in the non-CMC case where things become quite difficult and there are lots of challenges. Uh, and there's been recent work which uh, highlights some of the challenges and also show that at least there might be some, some nice things happening. So let me, let me remind you about, uh, well, first of all, what the, um, you know, the Einstein constraint equations. So most people are familiar with them, but just to uh, establish some of the notation. Uh, so the uh, Einstein constraint equations are, have to do with, of course, initial data. And um, this is for space-like slices, so we'll presume. And by the way, I, I'm writing uh, three dimensions, well, part, partly because I believe we actually live in three plus one dimensions, but most of the stuff I'm talking about here generalizes to higher dimensions, but I get sick of writing little n's over n minus ones plus threes and all that. So just think wherever you see three, you can replace that by n in various other places. Also, I'm going to leave out a lot, of con a lot of constants, as I'll show you. Anyhow, we're talking about initial data, and I'm going to use uh, gamma to represent the Riemannian metric, and k to represent, it's a symmetric two tensor, which effectively is the, is the time derivative of gamma, or the second fundamental form in the space time you develop from it. And let me for now use psi and pi to represent other fields that might be around, non-gravitational fields like the scalar field or fluids or Einstein Ma or the Maxwell fields or whatever. The constraint equations, of course, uh, restrict, uh, the, uh, restrict the, the choice of the initial data. Uh, the scalar curvature of gamma minus some quadratic thing in, in, in K is equal to either zero in the vacuum case or the energy density like E squared plus B squared if you have, say, Einstein-Maxwell. And then the other three constraints, the divergence of K minus the gradient of the trace of K is equal to zero in the vacuum case and it's equal to, uh, to, to the flow of energy in a sense uh, of the non-gravitational fields if there are non-gravitational fields present. In Maxwell, this would be E cross B. So why they matter, of course, there's the well-celebrated and well-referred to theorem of Yvonne from um, uh, 52, 53, whenever exactly it was, um, which says that, again, if you choose initial data which satisfies these constraints, then there exists a space-time development, which I'm writing here as so G, and then uh, th th which satisfies the Einstein equations and also induces the initial data given by gamma k and psi and pi. So those are the constraints. Um, and what we would like to know, among other things, of course, the evolution problem. There's been some discussion of that 
Um, that's extremely important, but one also wants to, uh, to know how do you actually construct solutions of the constraints? And might one be able to parameterize the solutions of the constraints in the sense of the old physicist's idea of finding the true degrees of freedom, finding functions which you can specify and then uh, specify freely and have uh, and, and from the, that data, uh, find solutions, uh, find uh, uh, initial data which does satisfy the constraints and have that, in a sense, all of them. Uh, and there have been a number of programs for either, construct, either uh, constructing solutions or parameterizing them. There's the conformal method and the very closely related conformal thin sandwich method. There's also the gluing techniques, and there's also the, I think, understudied uh, uh, stuff, uh, the quasi-spherical approach that Bartnick has, uh, has started, and there's been a little bit wor of work on it. But anyway, I want to uh, uh, focus here on the conformal method and conformal thin sandwich. So, as was earlier referred to, so, you know, the early, the, um, I think it was in Ian Sergio's talk, he was saying that the early work on, on the Cauchy problem on the evolution equations was largely done in France. And that's true of the work on the conformal method, which I think the first paper of that, uh, on the conformal method was from Andre Le Schlerevich in around 44. And I was looking at Yvonne's uh, old papers. I think her first one was around 57 on the conformal method, then more in 61, and then many, many more. And then later in the early 70s, uh, Jim, Jimmy York started working on, on the conformal method and, uh, and others uh, as well. But so the basic idea, the procedure uh, for the conformal method is you first choose conformal free data. This is the data you would like to freely choose. And then from each choice of that data, uh, find a solution. And the conformal data is, I'll use lambda to represent, again, it's a Riemannian metric. But here the idea is it's a Riemannian metric only up to conformal class. So you're actually choosing a conformal equivalence class, although to actually carry it out, you have to choose a representative of, of that class. But so there's a freely chosen Riemannian metric. And then there's a symmetric tensor, which is uh, trace free and divergence free with respect to lambda. And then there's a function tau. So given this information, you then want to go ahead and solve uh, the, what I'll, I'll call, oh, by the way, again, the, the, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, the, the, um, when you think about the constraints and the, and the, and the uh, fields you're trying to solve for, the initial data, it's a very underdetermined system. You have four equations for, in a sense, 12 unknowns in the vacuum case. But the idea here is you have a determined system in the sense that now what you want to do, given this freely chosen information, you want to solve uh, the, conformal, the uh, conformal constraint equations, which take the form of essentially a, a, a vector Laplacian on, well, what we want to solve for is a vector field W and a scalar field, a positive scalar field phi. And the equations are that you have uh, essentially a, uh, a, a vector Laplacian on W is equal to phi to the six times the gradient of tau. And then you have the Laplacian of phi is equal to the scalar curvature with respect to lambda times phi minus that sigma plus LW squared. LW, by the way, W is this vector field. LW is the, um, is the conformal killing operator. That is, think of it as a, as a, uh, a symmetrized first derivative, uh, uh, first gradient der der derivative on W minus the, um, minus the trace. You square that thing times phi to the minus seventh plus tau squared times phi to the fifth and try to solve this thing for phi and W. Um, if, by the way, again, I've left out one eighths and one twelfths and all that stuff. Yeah, let's not worry about it. But anyway, if you can solve these equations, then you can construct gamma by taking phi to the fourth times lambda, and you construct k by taking phi to the minus two times sigma plus LW plus phi to the fourth times lambda times tau, and that gives you a solution of the original system. That's the idea. And then the main question becomes, for which choices of this conformal free data, lambda sigma tau, does there exist a solution phi w? So that's what I'm going to focus on for most of the talk. But I first want to mention a kind of useful tool for answering that question in a number of cases. And that's what I'm calling the quasi-conformal covariance of the conformal method. So here, let me first remind any of you who have thought about this at all 
that the, uh, if you take the, uh, set, uh, the conformal method and restrict yourself to constant mean curvature, free, constant mean curvature free data, that is where tau is a constant, then, this, then, this, then the system is, in a, in a certain important sense, conformally covariant. So what I mean by that is the following. So again, we're talking about constant mean curvature data, lambda sigma tau, where tau is equal to a constant. And if you look back at, those, uh, at the conformal constraint equations, one of them says that the uh, divergence of LW is equal to phi to the 6 grad tau, but that, that goes away. And let's, for the moment, assume that we don't, we're, we're working in the vacuum case. Then LW will be equal to 0. And then you're left with just the remaining conformal constraint equation, often referred to as the Schleverish equation, which says that the Laplacian of phi is equal to r times phi minus just sigma squared phi to the minus seventh plus tau squared phi to the fifth. And it's easy to verify that this is conformally covariant in the following sense, that if you take a set of data lambda sigma tau which has a solution phi, then that's true if and only if for any, fun any positive function theta, you multiply lambda times theta to the fourth multiply sigma times theta the minus two, leave tau alone, that, this, that, that, the, uh, that the system corresponding to this free data will have a solution as well. And in particular, the solution is phi to the minus one times, uh, I'm sorry, theta to the minus, uh, inverse theta times phi. So, so in other words, if, you, if you're interested, I mean, this is interesting for both the point of view of how the solutions change, but also, more for the, uh, for the stuff I want to talk about today. It also uh, tells you that if you want to check for a given set of data, lambda, sigma, tau, whether the solution, it might be, uh, it might be easier to do a conformal transformation on it and see if there's a solution there. And there's a solution for this system, if and only if there's a solution for that system. To check this conformal covariance in the constant mean curvature case, it's easy to do. You simply plug in for, let's call it lambda hat is theta to the fourth lambda sigma hat is theta to the minus 2 times sigma, plug those in and do a little bit of monkeying around and you get uh, the same equation with phi replaced by theta, theta to the minus 1 times phi. So it's easy to check that conformal covariance. As I said it's, it's very, um, it can be very useful because uh, again, if you want to see if there's a solution for this data, it's a sufficient to check conformally related data. And for example, uh, one can use Yamabe to, to uh, so set you, if you're looking at a class of data, you want to see a class of free data, you want to see if there is a solution, you can say the metric is, is Yamabe positive. So that means that there's a conformal transformation which makes a scalar curvature equal to plus one in that case, then check it for that. And if you can show that, that uh, a solution exists in that, con in that conformally changed way for those simpl simplified equations, then you'll know a solution exists for the original case. So this all works for the class of constant mean, of constant mean curvature free data, constant mean curvature initial data for the Einstein equations. What happens if we try to do this for non-constant mean curvature data? Well, it's easy to see that it doesn't work it doesn't work in any sense, or it doesn't work in the, in the explicit sense. That is, you plug in, set of plug, well, plug in the, the uh, 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 lambda, lambda hat and sigma hat, plug them in, and you get a big fat mess, which is not uh, very helpful. On the, on the other hand, I, what I'd like to point out, and this was first uh, beat into my head by, um, by David Maxwell, is there's a sense in which uh, in which you can still carry these things out, even though, the, even though the equations themselves are not conformally covariant, there's a related system, uh, a, a form of the thin, conformal thin sandwich uh, setup, which is conformally covariant, and you can use this as a trick to help you with, uh, with finding whether solutions exist for different sets of free data. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about what the conformal thin sandwich setup is, and I'm calling this following uh, Maxwell, the conformal thin sandwich H method, H for Hamiltonian. And this I think was, uh, I think the first reference I see to this is by a paper of York and Pfeiffer. And the idea here is instead of just choosing lambda, sigma, and tau, uh, you also choose a scalar field N. 
that N might remind you of the laps. And in fact, in the original conformal thin sandwich setup, that is what it is. It's a lapse. But if you're doing this thing, you don't need it to use it. You know, you can use it in solving the constraints. You don't need to use it as the lapse if you want to then carry out the evolution. So just think of it as an extra piece of free data that you can choose. And what you uh, do now is solve instead of, you're still trying to solve for phi and w, but instead of the equations I wrote down before, you use these equations, where the only difference really is wherever you see an LW, you put a 1 over 2n in front of it. So, uh, so we have these equations to solve for phi and w, and then you construct gamma and k from uh, in a very, very similar way, again, with that 1 over 2n appearing here. And so if there's a solution phi w of this system for this conformal thin sandwich h data, then you construct gamma and k from this, and you have a solution of the constraints. So this, this is very useful. Well, I mean, then there's a lot of the original philosophy of, of York and others on the conformal thin, thin sandwich. But from the point of view of what I want to talk about here, uh, the importance is that this system is conformally covariant. That is, if you want it, there's a solution for lambda sigma tau n, if and only if there's a solution for theta to the fourth lambda, theta to the minus two sigma, leave tau alone, and then theta to the sixth n. So you, have, you can, again, carry out this business. If you want to know if there's a solution for this, do a conformal transformation to, simpler equa to uh, a simpler form of the equations. See if there's a solution here. If there is one, then you know there's a solution for the original set. OK, so that's the conformal thin sandwich. Uh, and, and Maxwell keeps among, uh, you know, besides telling me, showing me how this works nicely uh, for, for this. Uh, for this analysis, he also likes to think that this is the, uh, in the case of uh, non-CMC data, this is in fact the system that's best to work with. But forgetting that for the moment, just here I want to uh, mention what I mean by this quasi-conformal covariance, quasi-conformal covariance of the conformal method for all sets of data. The idea here is that, again, now just working with the conformal method, for, for the data lambda sigma tau, you want to know, is there a solution phi w? That's true if and only if you go to the conformal thin sandwich uh, setup, replace, uh, so replace uh, this data by add 1 half for the, um, uh, for the lapse. And then if you do the conformal transformation on this, including that 1 half, uh, so one knows that from what we set up there, that, uh, well, we know that there's a solution of the for the conformal method, for this data for the conformal method, if and only if there's a solution for the conformal thin sandwich method for this data here. So uh, what we're doing here is pointing out again that there exists a solution for the conformal method, if and phi w, if and only if there's a solution of the conformal thin sandwich equations for the same data with n equal 1 half. So doing that, again, one can uh, replace the problem of seeing if there's a solution for this data of the conformal method by seeing if there's a solution for this data of the conformal thin sandwich method. And that can be very helpful, as we'll see. In fact, it's, um, it's, uh, it allows us, I think, to, uh, well, in, in, in some sense to uh, get, at least in the near, certainly in the near CMC case, we can get a lot more results than we thought we had. So. Um, that is, so we can check if there's, uh, if there's solutions for the given set lambda sigma tau by doing that conformal tra transformation that gets us to the scalar curvature being 1, 0, or minus 1. Uh, and that will tell us whether we have solutions in the case we're interested in. OK, so that's a tool that we're going to use. And I want to now come back to the main question we're addressing here. For what sets of the free data, lambda sigma tau, does there exist a solution phi and w? And there's a standard, very simple example, just to point out that there's not always a solution. And that is if you take sigma 3 equal to the 3 sphere, choose the round metric, choose sigma identically 0, which you can always do, choose tau is equal to 1. If you do that, then the, uh, the vector equation with w, you get LW is equal to 0. And all you're left with for the Lichnevich equation is that the Laplacian of phi is equal to phi to the fifth. 
uh, we're working on a compact manifold, and so we know there's no, going to be uh, no positive solution on S3. Just see that from by integrating both sides, multiply it by phi and integrate both sides, or use the maximum principle. So there are clearly cases where solutions do not exist. So that leads us to say, well, can we catalog when solutions exist and when they don't? Well, if you're going to do such a catalog, there's a lot of different categories to think about. So let me just mention a few of these um, that one should consider. So first, there's the issue of manifold and the, mani the type of manifold you're interested in, the asymptotic. So one can work on the closed case, which is usually the first case people consider. Then there's asymptotically Euclidean. There's asymptotically hyperbolic or hyperboloidal. Recently, there's been interest in asymptotically cylindrical, which I think the physicists refer to as sort of trumpet-like asymptotics. And then, of course, you can look at, at, uh, at uh, uh, manifolds with boundary, which again would, um, would be somewhat like what, uh, uh, what Helmut was talking about earlier with these boundaries for, those, uh, for that data. Um, then there's the issue of the regularity. You can look at analyticity, which one of our earlier talks said is a no-no. But any rate, you can do that. Or you could look at smooth data, CK data. <laughs> 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 you can look at data with specified, uh, uh, specified, I'm sorry, specified uh, uh, degrees of, uh, of uh, differentiability. You can look at various Sobolev or Hulder spaces. Uh, and besides that, if you're working in one of these asymptotic cases, particularly, say, asymptotically Euclidean, there's various rates of fall off that you can build into the function spaces. And so you can prove existence of solutions, again, for all these different cases here. Then there's the business of adding fields. You can work with vacuum, Einstein Maxwell, Einstein Fluid, Einstein Vlasov, Einstein Dirac, lots of other things, and then w the seemingly uh, 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 harmless Einstein scalar. Although, again, amusingly, it seems as if the Einstein scalar is one of the hardest things to deal with. Um, in many, many of the results I'll talk about, uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, uh, state them in terms of the vacuum, but the Einstein-Maxwell and Einstein fluid scaled in an appropriate way is essentially the same thing. But the Einstein scalar turns out to be uh, difficult in ways I'll talk about. Um, and that's some work that I uh, did with Yvonne and Dan Pollock a while ago to sh point out some of the difficulties. Um, there's still the issue of, so in this catalog, you can, again, all those different uh, categories I was talking about so far, but there's also the different, different uh, types of free data. You can talk about constant mean curvature, near constant mean curvature, which I'll roughly de uh, define in a few minutes, and then there's non-constant mean curvature, the complement of those, and then there's the Yamabe class of the, uh, of the metric that you're looking at, and there's also things like a sigma. So I'll be stating results which will, which will uh, divide among themselves. To fit, you know, your solutions will exist or not exist depending on what Yamabe class you're in, uh, depending on whether sig sigma is identically zero or not. So roughly speaking, uh, I, I think the one can say that the successes, the cases that we understand quite well, in fact, we can say we have a nice parameterization is for constant mean curvature and near constant mean curvature, except in the Einstein scalar case. Um, there's also the issue, the near CMC results, pretty much all of them assume that there's no conformal killing field around. That's another problem that um, still needs to be handled. Then there's the non-CMC case, and it's not, a, it's not well understood. On the other hand, one of the things I want to report on today is, some, is that there has been uh, some nice progress, some of it in the last few years, and some in the last few months, in fact. And here, when I originally said uh, looming difficulties, or now I'm saying challenges, what happens here is things are much wilder than, I don't know if you'd say than expected, but certainly much wilder than in the cases in the CMC and near CMC cases. Okay, so um, the constant mean curvature case, I've already alluded, well, I gotta put that on here, don't I? Um, I've already alluded to why this is, uh, is, is quite simple, or certainly simpler than the non-CMC, near CMC cases. Uh, even if you have uh, non-gravitational fields around, 
um, and you have and the right and the right hand side of the of, of this equation is not zero you still have a semi decoupling so if as long as the gradient of tau is zero which is constant the constant mean curvature case then this equation is 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 simply an elliptic equation for w given the j which will depend on the non gravitational fields and then so you can solve this one first and we know a lot about solving this equation, and then go ahead and essentially look at solving the uh, Lichnevich equation. So it's relatively simple, and there's this old table that uh, I first wrote down um, about almost 20 years ago, uh, based on work uh, work done. Um, I guess some of it originally uh, Lichnevich, a lot of it done by Ivan. York, also Omar, who, and then I, I sort of did the one last case, which allowed me to, uh, to write down this table. But what it summarizes is for the, so again, here in this case, we're working with constant mean curvature on a compact manifold, a closed manifold sigma 3, and again, it works in higher dimensions as well. So um, here I'm writing down, the, this is the, uh, the, the met conformal metric is Yamabe positive, Yamabe zero, Yamabe negative, and this column here, sigma is identically zero and tau is equal to zero. Sigma is not identically zero, tau is equal to zero, then we flip, flip the other ways. So we have 12 different cases, and in each case, all the data which, which, which uh, is categorized by that Yamabe class and this condition on sigma and tau, uh, we can say whether solutions exist or don't. And so I have, so there are these various n's which say that no solutions exist, and the y's which say the solutions exist in that case. So that summarizes uh, a bunch of work done, uh, uh, as I said, um, by various people. I'll say a little bit, a tiny bit more about the, um, about the methods of proof later, but let me just summarize uh, the other cases. Uh, if we go to the asymptotically Euclidean case, this is work originally, I think, Cantor, Brill, and then Maxwell uh, cleared up some issues. I think Helmut did a little bit of work on this as well. Um, but here, uh, actually, the Yamabe classes on asymptotically, uh, Euclidean, for asymptotically Euclidean data are a little bit different than in the, uh, in the, on closed case. Again, in the closed case, you have Yamabe positive, Yamabe zero, Yamabe negative. And that's telling you whether you can conformally transform to plus one, zero, or minus one. It's also, if, you, if you're given, a, for a given metric, you can tell what the Yamabe class is by calculating a certain, uh, a certain uh, infimum or uh, supremum, whatever, of, of certain integral that I'm not going to bother to write down. That tells you which it is, and then, it, and then you go ahead and prove the Yamabe, uh, Yamabe theorem, and, and you can uh, classify the, uh, what you can conformally transform to. In the asymptotically Euclidean case, you again have this, you can, uh, you can again define Yamabe plus and Yamabe zero and Yamabe minus by, uh, by looking at those integrals. But the relevant cases are Yamabe plus and the complement of that, which I'm calling Yamabe other. Um, and the interesting thing in this case, if you take a Yamabe plus metric, in this case, you can conformally transform to R positive. You can conformally transform to R equals zero. You can also conformally transform to R negative everywhere. And, and um, yeah, so, it's, so again, it's, cla it's, it's classified by looking at those certain integral conditions. But what you can do is a little bit different in the asymptotically Euclidean case. And then, um, uh, and then there's the, the other case. Now, what happens here is, uh, of course, if this is constant mean curvature and we're talking about asymptotically Euclidean, that means that tau has to be zero. So the only relevant things are Yamabe plus, Yamabe other, sigma identically zero, sigma not identically zero. And what you find is in the Yamabe plus case, solutions always exist. Yamabe other, solutions don't exist. Um, and then there's the asymptotically hyperbolic case. I think this is the original work of, of uh, Lars Anderson and Piotr Kuschel. And in this case, again, I'm not, I'm not worrying about regularity and the like. Um, their solutions always exist. Um, I haven't said anything about uniqueness here. Uh, and in the constant mean curvature case, there's not a lot exciting going on with uniqueness. What happens is you can almost, in almost every case, you can show that the solutions exist and are unique. And that's important for the parameterization aspect. There's this one very special case 
uh, oh, I, I didn't mean to write Yamabe plus. This should be Yamabe zero. So if you choose a Yamabe zero metric uh, in, for compact uh, on a closed manifold, sigma identically zero, tau equals zero, then every constant is a solution. So there's, in some sense, what you'd say is a trivial um, uh, non-uniqueness there. Um, but in all the other cases, uh, it's, it's unique. I, again, that actually depends on whether you're assuming that, that the solutions uh, asymptotically go to one. You could also have the solutions asymptotically, I'm sorry, in, in the asymptotically Euclidean case, they can go to one, they can go to something, uh, some other constant as well, and you, can still, you still get solutions. But so what, about, what are the tools for proving this? Again, this is uh, a summary of, a, uh, of work over a number of years. I think uh, Yvonne's uh, original method was a version of Schauder type work, and then there's the sub and super solution theorem. Conformal covariance plays an important role here, and the maximum principle does as well. Um, and again, I'll mention that if you go to the Einstein Maxwell case, the results are essentially the same thing. The equations look very similar uh, in the constant mean curvature case. The only thing is instead of zero over here, you have E cross B here you have an extra term, but it's of the same type in the sense that the sign of the, uh, of the, of the coefficient and the, um, and the sign of the, uh, of the exponent here match, and that, that uh, helps quite a bit um, in, uh, in proving whether solutions exist. And Einstein fluid, appropriately scaled, also very similar. Um, the case that's not well understood at all is the Einstein scalar case. Again, this is work with Yvonne and, um, and Dan Pollack. And I think there's, there's been a lot of work uh, fairly recently on this system. But here, just to point out that it's, it's, it's trickier, we don't have, the, the, it turns out, so what's different here? Rather than just adding an extra phi to the minus something term uh, on the right-hand side of Lushnevich equation, the strange thing that happens is the term, the term uh, that just had a scalar, the scalar curvature times phi, now it has, let's take uh, psi to be the scalar field and pi to be its momentum. Think of that as psi dot. And it, we have uh, a slightly different uh, term in front of the phi. This term is, it doesn't, isn't very bothersome, but the trickiest term is that instead of having tau squared times phi, phi to the fifth, uh, now we have tau squared minus the potential for the scalar field, whatever that is. It turns out this, dealing with this term is not very difficult at all. One can replace the Yamabe classes by sort of Yamabe psi classes and everything works essentially the same. This term, as I said, is completely harmless. But this term, as long as tau squared dominates V psi, so in particular, for example, if you're working with a Klein-Gordon field where, uh, you know, or just, uh, where the scalar field is box psi is equal to zero, then this V is zero, and then you're back, everything's, everything's as it was before. But if this potential has, uh, if this potential can sometimes beat up, it would change the sign of this term, that causes a lot of trouble. Okay, so that's what happens in the uh, constant mean curvature case. Um, what happens in the near constant mean curvature case? Well, very roughly speaking, first let me say what I mean by that. Very roughly speaking, what it means is that the gradient of tau relative to tau is small. That's oversimplifying because in, in when you actually look through the proofs of these things, the gradient of tau sometimes has to be small relative to other things as well. But let's just, let me just t summarize it roughly as that's our condition for near CMC. So why does this make it harder to deal with? Well, that's easy to see because before, what made it very simple is because the gradient of tau is zero, that killed this term on the right-hand side. This equation, even if you have non-gravitational fields, is relatively simple and certainly decoupled from this equation. But now you have to deal with the coupled system. On the other hand, in a rough sense, it, it turns out that this uh, system is relatively manageable. And the reason is because uh, from this equation here, in some rough sense, I mean, one can make this precise, but this equation for LW tells you that uh, you can, uh, you can uh, control LW relative to some constant, which depends on various, uh, various Sobolev stuff, or holder, depending on what you're using, times phi to the 6 grad tau, and I'm meaning this as a pointwise uh, 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 estimate. And then if you plug that in 
uh, into the original Lishnevich type equation, in some sense what it does is it leads to terms, uh, some other terms I'm leaving off here, but you get, you get a, a, a tau squared minus, minus this constant times grad tau squared, and as long as tau squared is dominating grad tau squared, then this equation is again roughly similar to what uh, the Lishnevich equation is, the uh, one in the constant mean curvature case, and the same sorts of analysis can go through. Um, again, I'm oversimplifying it, but it is important. I mean, it, this is one key place where the smallness of the gradient of tau relative to tau is very important, controlling this sign. Um, but, uh, so it's, it's harder than the constant mean curvature case, but we do seem to understand, um, I have, a, have a, in, in a sense, a complete classification of what's happening there, so long as uh, the, there are no conformal killing fields. So again, I'm going to summarize the results with one of these tables, summarizing work. Again, Yvonne played a role in this work. It's one of the things we collaborate on. Also, Vince Moncrief, Omerhu, Alan Clausen, Maxwell, others worked on this. So here, the separation is the Imabi class, as it turns out, we're interested. And here, I'm just uh, considering on a closed manifold. We have Yamabi plus, Yamabi zero, and I'm dividing Yamabi minus into, uh, into two different classes. And this here, um, uh, even though in the CMC case, this just depended on the metric. Here, this depends on tau as well. So this is one case where you can conformally transform uh, to r is equal to minus tau squared and other cases where you cannot. So dividing it into those two classes, and then where the, uh, the classification on the top is whether sigma is identically zero or sigma is not identically zero. And you can summarize the results again by saying in this, in this category of conformal free data, there's no solutions, no solutions, no solutions here. And in these other cases, you do have solutions. So that's what happens in, for near CMC on closed manifolds. If you look at near CMC uh, uh, in the asymptotically Euclidean case, it's, it's even simpler. It just depends on the uh, Yamabe class, uh, well, the Yamabe class, again, dividing the Yamabe. Well, so we had Yamabe plus, now there's Yamabe other, and it depends on whether you can conformally transform to minus tau squared or you can't. And in these two cases, solutions exist. In this case, solutions do not exist. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the uh, near CMC case for hyperboloidal, asymptotically hyperbolic data, solutions exist. And I guess there's, there are, uh, I'm leaving out the asymptotically uh, cylindrical and other things as well, but uh, there's similar sorts of uh, results there. Solutions are uh, unique. In this case, one can show that solutions are unique. Um, the key tools here, actually some of the um, earliest work on this, Ivan was working, I think, with the implicit function theorem, an approach based on that, perturbing away from constant mean curvature. Vince and I were working on what I was later told was a constructive Gummel iteration. The idea is to, in a certain sense, decou uh, decouple these equations by, uh, by replacing them by a sequence of equations where you choose phi zero in some sense arbitrarily, then you solve this equation for uh, w sub one in terms of that given phi zero, then solve the Lishnevich equation for phi n w n, and then take that w that phi n, put it in here, and go to the go to the next one. So it's an iterative scheme, and then the idea is to take the show that for each value of n solutions exist, and then study the um, study whether, uh, whether the solutions converge in any sense. So that was uh, a key tool we used. Sub and super solution play a big role. And again, to complete those tables, I think when, the, when, uh, <clears throat> when we did the work uh, some years ago, uh, we didn't know about this quasi-conformal covariance. And so our results are actually stated in terms of uh, the scalar curvature being positive, or, or, ne or ne I guess, no, that original work was negative. The work with uh, Allen and Clausen was for a positive case, but with this quasi-conformal covariance, one can extend these results to the full uh, Yamabe classes. 
Okay, so um, that's what happens in CMC and near CMC. I think in a sense one can claim that the method works very, very nicely and uh, call that, uh, that's where a, a successful application of the, of the uh, conformal method to studying the solutions of the constraints. I, I should point out that one of the things that uh, hasn't been as successful as one might like is using it to build in the physical, the, uh, you know, you, Einstein's equations from the physicist's point of view are things you use to model physical systems. And if you want to uh, consider initial data for, for example, rotating black holes that are colliding, setting up initial data for that, building that into the uh, into the uh, into uh, the the initial data, which satisfies the constraints, is not always that easy. People do it, although they often assume immediately that it, that the uh, uh, background metric is conformally flat. And so I think one could do that. One would like to be able to do that in a cl in a more clever way. I guess some of these um, uh, post Newtonian methods are also used to help, but. Just using that, uh, and the, one, of the, the, one of the problems with the conformal method is that you, you get to choose data freely, but it's not the metric you're going to have in the end. It's this conformally related metric. So that's, that's an issue that I'm um, leaving out at this point. But anyway, what I want to talk about now is what happens when we're neither constant mean curvature or near, or near constant mean curvature. Again, I mean, in some sense, it's fair to say we know next to nothing, but uh, we know a bit more over the last uh, five, six years uh, than before, and I want to mention some of that work and finish with some of the work that's most intriguing and then it shows some of the wild, wild behavior that one might see. Um, so I want to focus on, in a sense, three programs, well, three plus, three plus one, I'll, I'll say the plus one in a minute. The first one is what uh, the guys who started it like to call far from CMC. Um, and this is work which was started by Holst and some others and later worked on, has been extended by others to other cases. And in a very rough sense, the idea is instead of assuming uh, near CMC grad tau uh, relative to tau is small, you allow tau to be almost anything, but now, one is, must, uh, now the assumption one makes is that sigma squared and if there's non-gravitational matter around that this is very small. It doesn't, if you look at the equations, it's not clear that this is going to help necessarily, but it does uh, in certain cases that I'll mention here. So um, the first case that was, uh, was, was done by Holst and his collaborators, Nagy and Sotskarel, uh, is presume that sigma 3 is closed, work in the Imabi plus case, and assume that sigma squared rho and j are, are, are small, and then one can show that solutions exist. So this is clearly far from C, far non-CMC uh, uh, data and for all these, you know, for as long as you're satisfying these conditions, you know that solutions exist. Um, one can do the same thing uh, in the uh, asymptotically Euclidean case, as long as, it's, it's, so the conditions are essentially the same as in, near, as in near CMC, but with that swap, that is, as long as in your Mobi plus or the Yamabi other, which allows conformal transformation to minus tau squared, small sigma squared, small rho, small g, we can prove that solutions exist. Um, this also results for asymptotically cylindrical and for uh, uh, manifolds which have boundary. Notice that I didn't mention anything about asymptotically hyperbolic, and that's because one of the key features of this method is it tends to work for Yamabe plus. Doesn't seem to work for Yamabe negative. Again, it's, if you go through the analysis, even, even a rough version of it, you can see why that's the case. But so this is not useful at all in the uh, asymptotically hyperbolic, which is necessarily uh, Yamabe negative. Um, the proof's here uh, based on the Schauder type theory, and one of the important features so far is that we know nothing about uniqueness in these cases. Uh, and again, it seems to be restricted to Yamabe plus. So that's one of the programs which has been successful in finding non-CMC, uh, finding uh, non-CMC uh, free data for which we know that solutions to the conformal method and therefore solutions to the constraint equations exist. A second method uh, started by um, uh, uh, Romain Gicot and uh, Matthias Dahl and Humbert um, 
uh, is what I some, sometimes call, like, I like to call the limit equation criterion program, uh, some of the later work, Sakovich, Diltz, and I. And the idea here, but again, uh, the original ideas uh, from these guys, the idea here is that one, I mean, the, the results one gets in a sense is the following. You show that if, so you choose a set of initial data, if you can show that there is no solution w, no non-trivial, so no, forget w equals 0, so that there's no solution w which is non-zero to this funny equation. The left-hand side is the familiar uh, vector Laplacian on w. The right-hand side is there's this constant here, alpha, times the norm of Lw times the gradient of tau over tau. And they call that the limit equation. So if you can show that there does not exist a non-trivial solution to this equation for any alpha between 0 and 1, then you know there has to exist a solution to the conformal constraint equations for that set of data. So in a sense, what you're not in a sense, but um, you are transforming the problem from study whether solutions exist to the conformal constraints to uh, show that solutions don't exist to that equation. So um, the results in that case, this was first done. Again, people often go with the um, closed case first, and their first work is for sigma 3 closed, no conformal killing fields, require the tau squared have no zeros, and they also have a condition that if you're in the Yamabe plus case, uh, then sigma squared is not identically zero. Um, so the results are that if you have data of this sort, then the limit, equation the limit equation criterion holds. Now again, that doesn't tell you whether solutions exist or not. It just tells you that you have this other way of checking whether solutions exist. Um, and I should point out it's not a uh, if and only if. It's just, it's just if you know that solutions don't exist to the limit equation, then you know that solutions do exist to the constraint equations themselves. It doesn't go the other way. Um, so, that was shown, and then in the asymptotically hyperbolic case, uh, one knows this works. Again, you have to have tau squared uh, greater than zero. And we recently are finishing up in the asymptotically Euclidean case. The, the fall off is a little bit delicate in this case, but also if tau squared is non zero and you control the fall off, you again have a limit equation criteria. Now, whether, again, this, this leads to um, uh, whether we, whether we whether one can use this method to find uh, solutions to the find data for which solutions of the equations exist, which are not, which are neither CMC nor near CMC, it's not clear yet, really. Um, one knows cases where you can show that solutions to that limit equation don't exist, but it appears if most of them are near CMC. On the other hand, the, the, I don't think the, uh, th there's plenty of room for uh, for um, uh, going further with that and finding it as a useful tool. This is rel relatively recent. The method of proof is kind of interesting. To me, it's partly interesting because I think uh, I talked to, uh, I forget which, who it was uh, originally, but I told them there's this funny thing you might try to do with the constraints that I, don't, I think will never work. Then they use that to generate this limit equation criteria. And the idea is this. If you replace the, equa the, the uh, usual, the, the system, the, the, the conformal constraint equations by a slightly deformed version in that instead of uh, vector Laplacian on W is phi to the 6 times grad tau, you put phi to the 6 minus epsilon, or in the asymptotically Euclidean case, you seem to need this extra factor. Leave the, the Lishnerovich type equation alone. It turns out in this case, one can find solutions quite easily, just changing that the 6 to 6 to the minus epsilon uh, uh, is, is very important. And in a sense, you can see it because remember, I was saying that in the near CMC case, you can do this kind of uh, rough analysis where this phi to the 6 ends up putting the LW and therefore the grad gradient tau in that tau squared minus phi to the fifth, uh, tau squared minus stuff times phi to the fifth. But if you put, uh, replace 6 by 6 minus epsilon, that doesn't happen anymore. So it turns out the equations are much easier to handle. So uh, the idea is to um, look at those equations. It's relatively straightforward to verify that solutions exist 
to these deformed equations and then study whether solutions, as, as epsilon goes to zero, do solutions to that, do these solutions converge to solutions of the full system? And uh, there's various energy conditions of certain types you can put in and you get this sort of dichotomy, not really, but uh, if, if the limit exists, that gives you the one thing. If the limit doesn't exist, it gives you the other. So that's the way the, uh, that method goes. I should, I should point out again here, uniqueness is not determined at all. This has nothing about uniqueness. It's just it's existence. Um, and again, the method is as good as what we know about whether we can show that there are no solutions to that limit equation. OK, so that's uh, the first two programs. Let me finish by talking about um, these relatively, well, actually, the original work of Maxwell is somewhat old, but I think it's been developed quite a bit in the last year. And I think it's, I used to just call these Maxwell's horrible toys. But uh, I think it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer that these are telling us about what's going on more generally. I mean, his original work was he just simply took um, uh, the three torus, flat, uh, lambda flat, and then sigma. Uh, and he assumed that there's two killing fields. So the whole analysis reduces to a one-dimensional problem. And then assume that, so if the uh, um, uh, trace-free, uh, trace-free tr uh, transverse condition, divergence-free condition of sigma tells you that this is roughly constants. And then in his original work, he took tau to be equal to uh, A here and B there with a discontinuity. And he found various strange things. But I think this, uh, some of the more recent work shows this is much more general. But anyway, by simplifying it very much, uh, it's, it's relatively easy to show whether solutions exist or don't s exist depending on how you change the data that you still have in sigma and tau. One of the things you're really doing here, and, and it was a, a bit of a, uh, a, one of the conditions in, in some of the earlier, uh, some of the other programs is that uh, is tau is generally kept away from zero. This is, the program here is to, to explore what happens when tau does in fact have zeros. Um, again, it's not dealing with the uh, issue of, of conformal killing fields. But what he found, and again, what seems to happen much more, uh, quite a bit more generally, is um, let me just give a, 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 a relatively simple archetype where the, of this is, each point here represents a, 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 a set of data here. And let's, let me use this as roughly the norm of sigma. And let me use th this axis as the average of tau over the oscillation of tau. So the uh, cases where tau has zeros are sort of from here on. And you go over here, and tau doesn't. But the interesting thing you get is you get uh, places where there's one solution, places where there's greater than one solution, places greater than two solutions, places where there are no solutions. So different sets of data for the same relatively simple system where you can have, um, where you can have all these kinds of behavior. And there's some other ones which I found a little hard to draw where you can show that there's four or more solutions. So this is the kind of thing we haven't seen before. Remember, I said uh, in the CMC we know that solutions are are unique except in that very special, very simple case where you understand what's going on. Near CMC, again, you seem to get uniqueness. In these cases, it appears as if uh, uniqueness is not guaranteed at all. And in many cases, it won't be. Uh, and this brings up also, as I said, I wanted to talk about three and a half programs here. Uh, I mean, this, is, this other program, actually, there's been quite a a uh, few papers in the last uh, couple of years on the Einstein scalar system. And this can be even for CMC. And there's been some intriguing stuff happening here. Again, remember the idea of the Einstein scalar, even in CMC, the problem you have is with this term. I'm mentioning a few of the people who have been working on this over recent years. Um, if you know the tau squared minus v uh, minus the potential for the scalar field is positive, you have the familiar existence uniqueness. It's when that's not the case that lots of things can happen. And one can find, again, cases where there's no solutions, one solution, two or more solutions. And parameterized sets of data where you can actually go through the transition where it goes. And sometimes you have this, uh, uh, this uh, sort of index type behavior where you flip from Either there's zero solutions or two or four, et cetera. So I'm not going to say much more about this, except, again, it's intriguing um, cases where the behavior is much wilder than one might have expected. 
So um, one could come back to ask overall the question, is the conformal method uh, effective for constructing, parameterizing solutions of the constraints? And again, the conformal method, or equivalently, conformal thin sandwich in various forms. For constant mean curvature, and again, uh, I, I, there's still more to understand for the Einstein scalar system, but generally we see that it's, it's quite effective. Near CMC as well. Non-CMC, I think until about six or seven years ago, we knew essentially nothing. Uh, now we're seeing uh, some things, and, I, and, and there are some ideas on how to continue. But I think the, the behavior is, is, is fairly complicated and therefore fairly interesting. Whether one will ultimately say that the method is useful as a way of parameterizing solutions, I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes uh, in his earlier work, Maxwell would say uh, the method is just dead there. And I don't like to think that. I did like to think that it's just more complicated and therefore more interesting. And I thank Yvonne for leading the way on, uh, on studying this program. And I uh, hope you'll continue to show interest in it. Thank you very much. Please. Can you allow metal fields in which that energy density has a finite tump? Um, yeah, I mean, as long as you're, for, you know, as long as you're doing the scaled version, you know, so the, you, you mean just matter fields with, yeah. I mean, if, if you're doing the scaled data, then it works the same way. So that doesn't, that doesn't affect anything. If you take the non-scaled data, then it can get complicated again. It's, it's rather artificial to scale the data. I mean, to scale the source. Pardon me? It's rather artificial. To scale the source. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, but uh, right. So then you, t right, because you're scaling the source and you're not really doing the physics that you want to do, and that's that's always been one of the problems with the with the conformal method. But even if you don't scale the source, you still have to scale the other the other information as well. But yeah, I mean, actually, I, I, I was uh, in, in a sense poo pooing what you're saying. I mean, saying that, that there's not much uh, change there. Yeah, I mean that brings up the issue of regularity. And uh, you know, again, in, in, I think in the original work, it's quite the original effect of charge. That's right, but I think uh, I'm forgetting again, Yvonne. Uh, Is it possible? You, pardon me. Can you do it? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, I think is I'm, I'm forgetting exactly the results for uh, you know for weak solutions that you might have in such cases, but I I, I think that's generally okay. Um, so there haven't been any surprises in terms of. You know, pretty much as, as much, uh, uh, you know, as low regularity as you might want, the method seems to work well. And that came up a, again with, uh, you know, some, in the Cauchy problem, uh, you know, when you're trying to uh, prove uh, that, that uh, you have well posed in this for, for fairly low regularities, which uh, Sergio and others have let him, but they are, yeah. Something like, like a fluid, you may have nice regularity where the fluid is and it's zero outside. It's just yeah. one position where you have a... I think that's okay. I, I think this, that doesn't uh, create any particular challenges. Sergio. Uh, you mentioned something about multiple black holes, uh, initial data. So can you say a little bit more and uh, what are the limitations? Well, it's just a matter of how are you going to choose, how are you going to choose a conformal metric and the sigma that's supposed to represent the, uh, I mean, this is, this is a modeling problem. It's not a mathematical problem as such. But how would you, you know, so what do people do? You could take sort of a Kerr, a, 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 you know, initial data for Kerr and sort of, and, and, uh, and glue them together in some, you know, with, in, in that. But this would be more the gluing technique. So the gluing technique would be. Yeah, the gluing technique. Of course, the problem you always have, and, and then, you know, the numerical guys will talk about this quite a bit, is you can sort of glue the, you can glue the, the initial data together, let the thing evolve, and then what you often get in your numerics is you get this spurious radiation, which is telling you, I mean, what you'd like, to, what, you, what, you, what you might think to do is, let's take black holes which is very far away, and then the, the gluing isn't, uh, is, isn't very difficult, but then the computers don't, you know, aren't good enough to actually do it until, you know, it's, it, it'll take months and months to actually do the problem. If you want to start with initial data that you can do in a manageable amount of time, you want the black holes to be relatively close to each other, and if you have them relatively close, you'd like that initial data to be what would have happened if the black holes had, had come in that way. And they don't know how to do that. And the conformal method doesn't give you any particular insight into it. And so what you often get is this poof of spurious radiation. And then one would like to think what you're seeing after that is what would actually happen. But 
it's a little, you know, if you're trying to see how much of the energy of the, uh, uh, of the system is converted into gravitational radiation, do you include that spurious radiation or not? I, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on what these guys are doing most recently, but that seems to be the issue. And um, yeah, so setting up the initial data for such a, um, a modeling problem is not easy. Could <laughs> uh, you make, uh, make a summary comment about the case when instead of taking CMC data, you take data on the past Lycon? Uh, I'm not an expert on the, on the uh, I mean, that's a very different, very different issue, and I think, I don't know where Piotr is, but. Uh, um, yeah, I mean that was what Piotr was talking about. Ivan also knows quite a bit more about the about the uh, uh, the constraint problem on on light codes. The constraints are very much simpler in that case. Yeah, um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. They're not completely trivial, as I understand. You, you, there's a little bit of st of work to do, but uh, yeah, I mean the. Pardon me. They are OGs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That very different problem. <laughs>